Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Styles of Writing, Styles of Thinking Roundtable. My name is Lauren Whitby, and I'm the Marketing and Communication Specialist Senior at the Institute for Humanities Research at Arizona State University. I'm thankful for the opportunity to introduce this event today. This roundtable is part of a, our, our IHR Spring 2021 series on academic writing and publishing. Through this series, we hope to provide scholars with the insights they need to successfully publish books and journal articles, as well as develop an engaging writing style for academic content. It's my pleasure to introduce our three panelists. Ian Bogost is an award-winning game designer and author or co-author of 10 books. Bogost is the co-editor of the Platform Studies book series at MIT Press and the Object Lessons book and essay series published by The Atlantic and Bloomsbury and is a contributing editor, editor at The Atlantic. Margaret Grebowitz is a philosopher who examines environmental imagination, desire, and the attrition of social life. Her short accessible books include The National Park to Come, Whale Song, and Mountains and Desire. She has written for The Philosophical Salon and The Atlantic and is currently working on Rescue Me, a short book about dogs, humans, and social life. Finally, Matt Bell is an award-winning author whose writing has appeared in the New York Times, Tin House, Conjunctions, Fairy Tale Review, American Short Fiction, and many other publications. A native of Michigan, Bell teaches in the Creative Writing Program at Arizona State University. At today's roundtable, each panelist will present for five to ten minutes on their approach to developing and crafting a writing style. The remaining time will include conversation among panelists and addressing questions from the audience. Please note that the chat function has been disabled for this webinar, but you can use the Q&A function throughout the event to send in your questions. And with that, I'll turn the time over to Ian, our first panelist. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, that's great. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for uh, uh, for for having me. Uh, there's so much we could talk about, and I, 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 I'm only going to scratch the surface, uh, but I did pull out some ideas that I thought were uh, were relevant uh, and interesting. So, um, okay, let's see. Okay, sorry, just one. My nightmare of, uh, uh, I thought I had all this set up. Okay, no problem. So, um, when we think about writing, when we think about editing um, in a professional context, there's all sorts of kinds uh, of editing. Uh, it's not just copy editing or editing in this abstract sense. And uh, one of the types of editing that happens at the very start and all throughout the process, uh, we call developmental uh, editing in, in, the, in the business. And developmental editing is like, well, what am I even doing? And why? And, and for whom? And to what end? Um, and it's a process that's extremely fundamental uh, to making work that's, uh, that's worthwhile. But it's a process that uh, uh, in the scholarly context, we often don't get to do at, at all. And you think you, you're like left on your own, you're supposed to come up with brilliant ideas and then you're supposed to go off and do them. And then when you've done them, you sort of emerge from your, your pit and you present them uh, to the world and they're supposed to be taken in you know, with small adjustments uh, or, or whatever. Um, and that's an interesting and, and sometimes uh, uh, a useful uh, way of doing a certain kind of work, but it also leaves you out in the dark, in, in the cold uh, really. Um, and, uh, and as a result, you get stuck inside your head. And sometimes that goes well, uh, and sometimes that goes um, uh, poorly. Uh, but a, a big issue uh, with not doing any developmental editing is you're kind of never sure how you're framing or thinking about your work in relation to uh, an audience um, uh, and a reader. And so I just wanted to, to, I don't have a ton of time in my introductory remarks, so I've picked out uh, a concrete example here. Um, um, in which I'm going to pick a little bit on this domain uh, that's known as the energy uh, humanities sometimes. And I know there's a lot of folks uh, at ASU who are interested in, um, in climate and energy and so forth. And this is really cool uh, work. Uh, a lot of it's really interesting to me, uh, but I just wanna show you just a couple examples, which I've admittedly cherry picked of how this domain um, has framed uh, its work in, re in relation to the world. This is an anthology that Hopkins uh, uh, published. And if you sort of look at the way that they're presenting it, a lot of it is about, you know, gosh, we have something to offer. I'm a humanist. Please listen to me in the way that I think and speak uh, uh, to the world. Um, there's also this sort of this sort of promise that 
um, that some wrong is going to be righted, uh, that uh, we haven't been able to think properly uh, about uh, issues of, of climate change because we're not looking at them through a particular uh, uh, lens. And, and that's all, all well and good and, and, and interesting. Um, but it is uh, our, an, an argument made from the vantage point of the scholars speaking to other scholars. Right? I'm trying to situate my work in the context in which <clears throat> it would normally uh, exist and in which you know why you're here in the first place. Uh, here's another example. This is a little bit older. Um, that uh, the you know this this sort of will make a bold upright claim. Uh, the humanities are key to moving civilization forward without greater insight. So there's a lot of talk about how to talk about these ideas in this in this material, uh, which is good and has a certain place. But it's it's all very meta discursive for one, um, and it's also assuming a certain orientation. Uh, uh, toward the work, which is very different actually than the orientation you would need to get some of this stuff uh, into the heads and, and hearts <clears throat> and hands uh, of, the, of the audience uh, that we purportedly have in mind when we pursue uh, this kind of um, discourse. So looking at this uh, example again in the, in the Hopkins, you know, I'm, I'm like broad brush uh, treating this stuff. So it's, it's unfair, but you know, for the purposes of our initial conversation, just bear with me here. Um, Today's energy and environmental dilemmas are fundamentally problems of ethics, habits, <clears throat> imagination, values, institutions, beliefs, and power. Okay, great. That's like like we can agree with that. But imagine presenting that to um, to an ordinary reader uh, or an ordinary person, your neighbor, your grandmother. Um, like, what are they supposed to do actually with that? Are you going to disagree? No, I don't think it's a matter of ethics or values. What we choose. No, they would agree with that. But then what? You know, then how do you how do you sort of address it? Um, and I picked this domain because I'm working on a on a short piece. Uh, well, it's actually not that short, but it's short by academic standards um, right now. This is a little bit behind the scenes, so like be judicious with this view. But um, anyway, I'm writing about uh, uh, electric uh, uh, heat pump space and water heating, and uh, and the whole framing. This is for the Atlantic, and the whole framing that that we're using uh, in this piece and in this series is what can we put into the hands of ordinary people that they can use and act upon and, and you know, try to understand and, and, and turn into action. Um, and so I don't wanna go, I don't have time to go through um, all of this in, in complete detail, but I just wanna show you like the, the kind of conversation that my editor and I are having about the, the framing of, of this piece. Um, and, and you know, one of the things that I'm trying to do here is to say, because you feel like you can't do anything when, when it comes to climate change. That's how most of us feel, I think. Like, yeah, that's all well and good, but nothing is good enough. We need policy changes. We can't do anything as individuals. But no, actually, there are some things you can do as individuals, and it doesn't need to be uh, photovoltaic, and it doesn't need to be buying a $100,000 Tesla or something. Um, and one of, this, one of the moves I'm trying to make here is that the, the transportation angle is, is important, but but actually home energy usage is uh, is is substantial, um, and so making changes in in residential home energy uses can actually make a big difference, and you have control over those in a way that that has higher leverage. So we're having this whole conversation about like how to shift the frame in the start of this piece um, from cars to to homes, and um, and and you know so one one thing my editor was doing was just like you know pull it in like let's get to it. Uh, a, a more rapidly, very common editor sentiment. Um, but we're having this whole back and forth, just like pulling out this very surgical observation here. We're having this very, like, um, this, this extensive back and forth about how to talk about cars, because I want to move the reader away from cars. And I have this sort of like, okay, let's, you know, let's acknowledge that cars are a problem when it comes to emissions. But actually, and this is what I'm saying here in this comment, it's like, well, you know, emissions are bad. Um, uh, uh, fossil fuel emissions from vehicles are, are bad, but cars are are amazing, and we love them as Americans. And as you can see, we have in the copy. You know, we have to acknowledge the convenience and and the car orientation of our. So we're thinking here very deeply about like, gosh, like, are we? How do we get our readers that we want um, uh, to speak to in this piece uh, into the piece in the first place, so we don't lose them uh, 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 a story? Uh, straight away. And, and, you know, that's an example of uh, uh, a developmental editing. Um, and in this case, we're, you know, down to a line editing technique um, that, that we don't necessarily get an opportunity to pursue as often as we, uh, as we ought to uh, in the scholarly world. And it would benefit any kind of writing for any kind of audience, including, you know, a journal, a, a scholarly monograph, uh, or what have you. 
So that's uh, that's just like one example. That's what I brought to start us off. Okay. <laughs> I think I'm next, right? Uh, uh, okay, wonderful. Um, let me see here. All right. So um, I come to this from a slightly different perspective than our other two panelists, uh, because my training is in continental philosophy, right? It's not in literature or writing. Um, I've never taught writing, and, uh, and my own home discipline has been sort of extraordinarily resistant to any shift towards public facing work. And uh, this is interesting given that uh, so many of our most famous public intellectuals are continental philosophers. Um, I have in mind Zizek, Cornel West, um, Judith Butler, um, people who have training in that tradition. So it's interesting that on the non-celebrity side of the discipline, there's this um, uh, continued resistance to any shift in the uh, approach to what counts as philosophical writing. Um, and the moment I turned to more accessible writing in my own life, I was met with the response over and over that what I was doing was not philosophy, right? Indicating that there was no way for the discipline to sort of stretch in this direction in particular. Um, and it was actually several years later that I first encountered the term public humanities. Imagine my delight, right? A very happy day when I realized that, I, that this was, you know, I was not some sort of isolated phenomenon, but that there was this, um, uh, this, this sort of movement taking place. Um, but I think uh, the, the more that we talk about the public humanities, because we don't really know what we're talking about when we say that, right? The more we, we, we debate that, um, uh, the more I notice, at least in, in how I've heard it debated, um, that, that what's really missing is a conversation, a serious sustained conversation about this relationship between writing and thinking. Um, and so today, rather than talk about my own process as a writer, I'd like to just sort of say a couple of words about um, how this, this idea of accessible writing, right? How it sort of troubles this relationship between writing and thinking. Um, so, so thank you for inviting me and I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that we're, that we get to talk about that, um, because I don't think we do it enough. So <clears throat> public facing university on one hand, right. And accessible writing on the other hand, what are we, what are we getting at when we, um, when we constantly sort of re rework that connection, right. What is it that we're after? I have, um, three short points to make here. First of all, I think um, the public facing university is often imagined as a matter of reaching a, a, a bigger public, right? Um, and what's at stake there, uh, for the humanities at least, it seems to be about being able to sort of set the agenda in public conversations. Um, and I think that this is a very limiting and limited way to think about what's desirable about public facing work. Right? Is it really just that we want to reach greater numbers of people? Right? And if so, why? What's at stake there? So when I, when I thought about how to prepare for today, um, and I started thinking about this idea of accessible writing, um, if, we, if we play with this notion of access, right, we find ourselves wondering, like, wh whose access? Whose access to what? Right? Is it that I, as a writer, am trying to access a public? Is it that my writing somehow facilitates the public's access to what? Right? To me, to my ideas? Or is it the public's access to the kind of research that's being generated by the university, right? Produced by the university? And so I found myself returning to this um, sort of very, you know, and forgive me for this very sort of almost highfalutin uh, uh, kind of um, uh, almost um, virtuous kind of idea of, you know, what good writing should be, right? That, that good writing is writing that, that facilitates the reader's sort of entry into the world, right? That the access that we should really be concerned with as writers is, um, the way that we get our readers um, 
into intractable, uh, unintelligible problems, right? And the way that we help them navigate those. So what makes writing good isn't just that it reaches a lot of people, it's how it reaches them, right? And what it allows them to do when they're no longer reading. Um, and so that's one thing I, wanna, I want to say um, about how I want us to kind of think about accessible writing in a much deeper sort of, um, I don't know, thicker way, right? Than just how I often hear it um, described in the academy where, you know, accessible writing often gets poo-pooed on as if it were this, you know, dumbed down kind of thing, as if it were precisely thinner, right? Rather than thicker. And, um, and that the more people it reaches, the less it says, or the less it, or I should say the less it does in the world, right? So that's my first point. Second point, um, is very is very simple in a way, but I think it, it bears repeating. One of my mentors, Jean-Francois Lyotard, uh, wrote sort of in, towards the end of his career that persuasion isn't the only goal of communication. And I think this is something we don't sort of sit with enough, right? He I, he used the word discourse, but um, I don't know. That's kind of like a '90s word. I don't know if we do if we're still doing discourse. Um, so I, I like to now use the sort of uh, broader word communication. This idea that persuasion isn't its only goal. And I want to appropriate this idea to say something um, slightly different, right? That there's more than one way to help someone to think, right? And persuasion isn't the only thing that shapes or directs people's thinking. And we could also, also um, I think, say even more that, that there's more than one way to persuade <laughs> someone, right? That persuasion by itself is already a very complex process. So even arguments that we recognize as fantastic arguments are probably doing more than just arguing, right? They probably have virtues other than just the good argument that make them a good argument, right? So here is where we get into things like affect, style, um, uh, words, that, <laughs> words that, you know, I think, I think philosophers are not, are not super comfortable with, but, um, uh, but but would 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 do well to really engage with a little bit more, and so for me, writing for a broad audience, uh, a broad audience, writing for a broader audience has been very much about that, about learning how to affect thinking on multiple levels at once, right? And that's how I like to think about what it would be to write a great piece. Um, you know, we can use these kinds of scary romantic words like what it means to move someone. Um, we certainly know what it means to be moved, right? But how do we move someone? My third point <clears throat> is that I think both of these points are, are connected to what education is really about, right? Um, so I'll go out on a limb and say what I think education is about. <laughs> uh, you know, creating connections, creating ways into the problems, right? And creating what, what have, you know, in the past, what has in the past been called opportunities, right? And I think we've been using this notion of opportunity in a very limited way. We always talk about opportunity as if it were an issue of the job market. Um, but that's a very limited way of thinking about it, right? Of what an opportunity is. Um, and so this, this brings me back to this notion of the public facing university, right? When we argue for more accessible writing as we are doing here today, right? When we argue for that, um, it's not that we're talking about something non-academic or some or even something extra academic, right? We're just stretching the boundaries of this thing that we as academics love, namely impact, right? We're stretching the boundaries of impact. Um, and that if that's not the ultimate educational goal, I don't know what is. Um, and I think one more thing I wanna point out is that this new movement in writing by faculty with access to tenure, right? At, at whatever level they are at, in that process, right? This, this new movement by, uh, in writing by faculty with access to tenure is also corresponding with um, a, a sort of marked increase in what we're calling para-academic work, um, which I think is interesting to note. Um, what we mean by para-academic work is also complicated, right? It, it can take many forms. Um, 
I'm interested in the articles that go viral that are by writers that are working as adjuncts or folks who have left their academic jobs for some reason and now are doing other jobs. So this is an interesting phenomenon to me. Why are we as academics so interested in these articles? Why are we all sending them to each other, right? Um, I'm thinking a few years ago, you might remember um, Ellen Tara James Penny, the homeless professor, right? Who lives in her car, right? And uh, uh, in Silicon Valley, because as an adjunct teaching four or five um, classes a semester, she still can't afford um, rent in Silicon Valley. So it begins as a sort of tragic, as, as a tale of tragedy, right? But then she's written about in The Guardian in Inside Higher Education, and then she's reported on by CBS. And it turns into a very sort of interesting, complicated, uh, almost success story, right? Um, and I'm also thinking of Stephen Salaita's uh, articles about going from his endowed professorship to working as a school bus driver, right? Those articles went viral. So I'm interested in this Venn diagram, right? This shift to accessible writing on the other hand, this rise of the para academy on the other hand, and then this huge interest in articles that that are sort of pop articles about the rise of the para academy. And to me, what this shows is that the university, university, right, rich, writ large, is sort of like just overflowing its bounds. Like it really just can't contain itself. And we're we're very interested, we and all, all of us, everyone, the world, right, are very interested in, in what's happening at that boundary. So when we talk about accessible writing, we're actually sort of living in that problem space, which I think is one of the most sort of dynamic, interesting problem spaces of the moment, right? Um, so that is, that's, that's me for today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret. Thanks so much, Ian. These are really fantastic. Um, I, for people who don't know in the audience, I'm mostly a fiction writer. I, I do some nonfiction writing, but mostly write novels. And so we'll, we'll sort of be coming at thinking about style from that point of view. Um, you know, I think sort of baked into sort of the premise of this panel was that the idea that like the ways in which we write affect the ways in which we think. Um, and so thinking about as, as a writer myself and as a teacher of writing, how we sort of learn those things together. And I just have a quick little three part uh, uh, thing here. Um, they're numbered, but really they could be on imitation, influence, and work. Um, so I'll just begin here. One, how should we learn to write in order to arrive at how we want to think? You might begin with the imitation of sentences, paragraphs, and structures you love, hoping their examples will lead you to your own style. Know that this means styles you love not styles you think you're supposed to write like. When you find yourself moved emotionally, intellectually, morally by a piece of writing, ask what it is that moved you and how that effect was created by the language on the page. Then make something of your own, beginning in, imita in, in, beginning in imitation, but open to where instinct and preference take you. Elaine Scarry says, beauty brings copies of itself into being. Sometimes it gives rise to exact replication and other times resemblances and so other times to things whose connection to the original site of inspiration is unrecognizable. In other words, if you want to learn to write well, whenever you read something beautiful, write something beautiful in response. Um, I'll say for myself, like my almost entire urge to write comes out of uh, initially like ins uh, imitative inspiration. I wanted there to be more things like the things I love um, and so set out to make my own. Uh, follow your instincts and preferences, but don't be afraid to try styles that don't come easily to you. In what at first seems foreign or difficult, you might find new and surprising thoughts and feelings. Uh, this is one of the reasons constraint-based writing exercises like the language games of the Alipo movement are so generative. Being forced away from your default style also leads you away from your default thoughts and feelings. Two, the more unique a writer's style seems, the more influences it'll eventually be revealed that they're drawing on. The most innovative writers I know are almost always the most widely read. Um, now that they're widely read by others, but they're widely read themselves. Corv McCarthy says, the ugly fact is books are made out of books. The novel depends for its life on the novels that have been written. Zadie Smith says, all my books are made up of other books. 
I suspect a lot of other people's novels are like that too, though they might be slower to talk about it. Mark Twain said, the kernel, the soul, let us go further and say the substance, the bulk, the actual and valuable material of all human utterances is plagiarism. It's possible that somewhere there are writers born geniuses, writers not in need of influences, instructions. But I believe the hard truth is, if you were one of those people, you would already know. Assuming you're not such a natural born genius as I am not, what can you do? Learn to love influence, to seek it out, to crave it, to wallow in it. Read as widely as possible in your own field and outside it. Read across eras and movements. Read work published by different sizes of presses. Read in translation across genre lines. If you read only the books everyone else is reading, you'll only be able to write the same books everyone else is writing. Three. Um, I'll end with one of my, my favorite quotes about the writing life. It's from novelist Jane Smiley, who says, I believe that you either love the work or the rewards. Life is a lot easier if you love the work. The writing itself and all the thinking and feeling and invention and surprise that goes into it, that emerges from the hours you've spent at the desk, is the reward that lasts. The other rewards, publication, critical esteem, the admiration of your peers, sometimes even cold, hard cash, are all about outside validation, subject to the whims of the marketplace and fickle at best. But the work itself, the style you develop and what it makes possible is yours forever. What you wrote, what you felt and thought while you wrote it and how you were changed by what you attempted, what you risked, what you achieved for yourself. Thank you. Can I ask a quick question maybe coming off of Margaret's uh, uh, talk? I'm thinking a little bit when you're talking about audience, and I think Ian was also, you know, talking about that in the way they're sort of editing toward the audience or what the audience uh, needs or desires or what you want from them. I'm I'm wondering how much of like the style you're working in is sort of influenced by audience in that way. I feel like as a as a fiction writer, mostly it's not or not initially. Like maybe in like late editing, you're making turns toward the audience in a certain way. But most of my drafting is not done with like the audience in mind in that way, or at least the audience is myself in a certain way. Like I'm making something that pleases me before I'm that concerned with how it will affect the reader directly. Um, where in that process is the audience start becoming part of your stylistic question? Well, I can, I can start, I can, I have just a, um, I was actually thinking about this as I was listening to Ian too. I mean, I, I don't have as much experience as Ian does in, in working in with, with those kinds of venues. But my limited experience with that, I mean, you can just kiss your own style goodbye. Like that's just, it's, it's so not about that, right? It become, or rather questions of style become completely different than what you thought they were, right? Um, you, you receive uh, your draft just completely rewritten and then, and then you rewrite in response, right? So what emerges from that and, and, um, uh, my my friend um, Chris Shaberg, who sort of who took me through this this process, really the first time I I I, I did it at the Atlantic, I was emailing him in tears, and saying I I can't do this. You've got to be kidding me. This isn't cool. Where did I go? You know. And he said, just trust it. Just keep going through that process with your editor. And I think this is what Ian means by what did you call it? Developmental editing. Yeah. Is that what it was? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, again, this is how, how I actually don't have experience. I don't even know these, these, these terms yet, right? Um, but when he told me to kind of trust the process, he said, at the end, you'll have something absolutely amazing, right? And, and that is indeed what happened. But the process itself was quite painful precisely because you have to forget everything you thought you knew about your own writing and what you think is good writing and you know who gets to who gets to edit what <laughs> in what you've said um yeah so i i think it's very different than what you're describing matt i mean maybe one way of of thinking about this is um rather than style being either an expression uh, of the self or a relinquishing of that self there's there's a million gradations in between and, and you want to, to know where you are on that spectrum and why. So, you know, it's interesting what Margaret just said about sort of releasing 
you know, you're subjecting yourself to another style. And that's true in a literal way. You know, if you write for a magazine or a newspaper, they have a style guide and they have a way of, of doing editorial and, you know, a whole set of concepts about how to, about why they would be accepting and publishing uh, uh, pieces. And that provides structure and constraint around your work, which is always good. Um, does it necessarily uh, impinge upon or, 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 or abscond uh, with style? Well, the interesting thing about that question to me is what it uh, suggests about the assumptions that we make about it. So on one extreme, you have a, a writer, and it could be a scholar or it could be another kind of writer. It doesn't really matter. I think scholars are, are prone to it because we're left on our own so much, who think the thing that I'm inclined to do is me. And so when you question it, you're questioning my, my identity. And, and if, you, if you stop and say, okay, wait a minute, though, is this really my identity that's being questioned, or is this something more surgical? Um, <clears throat> in which case, then you can have a conversation about it, which is exactly what happens all the time. So I'm, I'm always um, going back and forth with my editors, editors I've worked with three, for years and years, like, no, th this, this really has to, to be there. Um, and this is what working writers do is they, 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 they fight with, <laughs> sometimes we, they would fight, we don't really mean it, we negotiate. Um, and that's because there's many parties uh, involved. So I, th I think that that is a different mode than, um, than, than we're reared in the scholarly tradition to anticipate, even though it also exists within that tradition. And, you know, like, isn't that what the reviewer to kind of thing is all about? It's not really like, it's not, it's really like, I, I am telling you what I see through my eyes as a reviewer too. And, and that's why peer review is so sort of broken at, at times. It's like, that's not really peer review. It's not like, is this scientifically accurate, especially if you're a philosopher or a, or a critic, like most, most, many of us are. It's rather how to go about asking and answering these questions at all. Um, so, uh, you, you know, that, those are some, sort of my senses about it, about it, Matt. I, I, I do think that nonfiction writers very much think of themselves as having that same appeal to style that, that fiction writers do, sure. though, and, um, and of wanting to... Uh, be pro stylists, you know? Um, and I don't know that a lot of scholars want to think of themselves as pro stylists, which is interesting. They may have very particular opinions about how their prose ought to work, but maybe they're not thinking of it as the craft of, of prose writing. Yeah, that sounds right to me too. I, you know, I, I thinking about the way styles are influenced by where you're at too. I, I've wrote, written three things for the New York Times book review over the years. And before I wrote for them, I was always like, everything in the New York Times book review kind of sounds like it's in the same voice, right? You sort of have that, like, how do all these writers do this? And then I would write things for them and they'd be like, this is great. You're such a beautiful writer. Thank you for this. You don't really have any edits, but they'd change like one sentence, but then they would actually change tons of stuff and make it sound like the New York Times, right? They just wouldn't ask me about that stuff. They were just, right? They were just like chop up my sentences and, and make it a little different. It wouldn't change the substance of what I said at all, but it would read like everything else in the New York Times book review reads. And I found that sort of shocking the first time and then later just sort of expected it. Um, but it was interesting, these ways in which without in any way to me changing the, the substance of what I was saying, they didn't also feel like they needed to ask me about any edits that just made it house style, right? Those weren't up for debate. It was going to look like everything else in the New York Times in a certain way. Um, and it was interesting to sort of go through that process and come out feeling like, yeah, that's something I wrote, but also not how I would have done it. Um, but probably more correct for their purposes afterwards. Um, yeah, it's a curious process. But Matt, did you think it was better than what you would have done? Initially? It was a better New York Times article for sure, yeah, right? Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, absolutely, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, part of the consistency of reading the New York Times for years and years and years, they all sound like that. You know, and there's sort of a, a tone to it. Um, you know, people writing for the New Yorker sound different from each other, but they also always sound like they're in the New Yorker. You know, really? there's sort of a, yeah. Um, that that overall vibe somehow, which I, I think I used to think was partly the kind of writers they picked, which is probably true, but I think it's also partly the editing, right? There's sort of that that application of, of style to it in that way as well. You want, should we take some questions? Yeah, there's some great questions in the Q&A. So Do you see one you were attracted to, Ian, or should I just start working through them? Um, there are a lot. Um, you know, I think... Um, uh, why don't you pick one? <laughs> sure. Let's start with uh, let's start with this uh, a question from James Wormers. Um, one thing that has not come up yet in this conversation, James says, is race. 
academic writing is a communitive practice deeply imbricated, especially in US America, with white and middle class assumptions. How does or can publicly facing work begin to move beyond these kind of assumptions to allow writers and the work to reach more diverse audiences and take on an anti-racist character sorely needed in the conversations we're having in and beyond the university? I don't want to start here. I'm not an academic writer in the same way. So I feel like I don't, maybe my answer isn't first there, although I can talk about it from a, a fiction teaching sort of way as well. But if there's something either of you would like to respond to first. Um, I mean, maybe one thing, there's another question in here somewhere that I saw that is related. And I'm going to try to, um, it's the one about, uh, could someone unpack the emergence and meaning of the term accessible Great. writing. Uh, and these are different, but related. And another version of this question that arises often, it, it, and maybe it was in here too, or, or maybe I'm just synthesizing from a million places, but this sort of idea of an audience or the idea of like a general reader as if that is something that exists, which it doesn't. Um, so I think, you know, one, one thing we can start to pull out of this is that there are, there are, there are people, um, and we sometimes call them uh, audiences when, when they're on the other end of, of, of a, a media forum. Um, and, and those people are inside of lives that they're living um, that have challenges um, in which they access, they're able to, to, uh, to, to find and, uh, and engage with ideas in some ways and not others um, in which they, uh, they, they may suffer or endure things that, um, uh, that are similar or different to, to the ones that, uh, that those of us on this, uh, on this call or, 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 or others that matter. And, and so like, if we just kind of explode this idea that there's a singular way of, of doing any of it, then it doesn't solve the problem exactly. And certainly the media industry is struggling right now with all of this, all of this too, of, you know, and how to, uh, how to appropriately diversify and, um, and, and, and create participation in their, in their newsrooms that then might, are, like, is that representative of national audiences if all of those folks um, also went to Oberlin or whatever, you know, like there's lots of questions to ask uh, uh, about this. Um, and we, you know, our prestige media are uh, exactly white and middle class, and in precisely the way that's been um, that's been addressed here, but also uh, are more complicated than that uh, than that too. So, you know, the I don't really have an answer to this question because I think it's not a, a, a question that has a simple answer. Um, but if we can embrace as as scholars the idea that that impact, which has come up a couple of times already, uh, it doesn't necessarily just mean that you wrote a killer article in your field's killer journal that got cited n plus one times, um, or that you know you, um, you you wrote you wrote the right book with the right press that created the right conversation in in your uh, in your field's conference, you know, national conference or, or whatever. Then we open the door to beginning to 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 address some of these some of these concerns. Um, so what I see, and I, you know, I have these conversations a lot. What I see is an increasing uh, acknowledgement of need and openness to um, different ways of conceptualizing, um, supporting, and measuring a professional. Uh, productivity and output in our fields, broadly speaking, um, and I like the idea of focusing there because then it then it doesn't tempt us to say ah like you know here's the answer um, because there's probably not there's probably not um, an answer uh, uh, like that right like there may be a case when having a particular author write in a particular white middle class venue who's coming from a very different perspective that might be a very effective um, intervention at a particular moment on a particular subject. Would it be enough? Well, no, it's, a, it's, it's one thing. So being able to look at that thing for what it is, not just a byline, but something, something potentially uh, more than that requires looking at it as a, as a, as a unit of, of, of solitary, you know, uh, creativity and, and uh, intervention, not just as a, oh, you, you, why were you doing this instead of writing a journal article or what have you? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, if I if I can interrupt, Ian. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think what's what's am amazing about you know what we're describing as the shift to to more accessible presentation of work or mo multimodal presentation of of research, right? Is that there's there's more than one way to present research, right? So that. Um, If you've got something like, I don't know, if you've got something like a podcast that's suddenly reaching an, an enormous audience, you know, your if, if we're now just speaking as academics, you know, your your department needs to sit down and, and, and figure out how to evaluate that, right? How to have that count or not or not count, but you know, hopefully count towards why your value why one is valued, right? In at the university, at the institution. So while you know i'm 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 a i'm a pretty fervent defender of of like pure research i know it's incredibly complicated but i i want to i want to somehow hold on to this idea that there is such a thing as research and there is such a thing as peer review and we need to sort of protect those and figure out how to do them better ever better right um at the same time i think there's a big difference between research and publishing they're somehow not the same thing and publishing can take we're finding out that publishing, making public, can take all these different different forms, right? Um, and and if someone is incredibly strong at a particular form, then that needs to be um, encouraged, and that needs to be uh, uh, he held up to a kind of peer evaluation. That if your department is not in a place to evaluate it, you get external evaluation. Right, you you make it possible for these new forms to to not only exist but grow right in their own worlds um, and thrive and change and that's really what we should be doing. So I think of it as um, it's it's not just pub, it's not just about you know taking an, an academic article and making it simpler for broader audiences. Again, I think that's, a, that's not a good way to think about what's happening. What's happening instead is this, is this, this plethora of new forms of getting, in, getting knowledge out there, right? And I think that that will, that that sort of by its very nature, in its very nature, um, addresses James's um, uh, concern here. Yeah, and there was a it was, there was a comment to this regard. Peter Brown's question about uh, uh, are, is the class of all potential readers uh, homogeneous? The, the, right. simple, and the answer is no. You know, it's just like right. yeah. um, and we have to be really careful about that. Um, just as the the audience, just there is no such thing as an audience. Well, there is a such thing as an audience, but there's no such thing as a general audience or a whatever. Once you start putting adjectives in front of them, there's always some particular. Um, reader, viewer, listener, context, et cetera. Um, and so we, we, we do need to you know, be very attentive to that. The um, uh, novelist Claire Bay Watkins wrote an essay for Tin House a couple of years ago called On Pandering that I, th I think is online. So it's pretty easy to find. Um, and one of the things she talked about in that essay, um, her first book of short stories called Battleborn was a, a, a you know, award-winning book. It did really well. She's a very successful young writer. Um, and in the essay, she's reflecting on the style of those stories that uh, that she felt that her style as a writer was in some ways uh, determined by who she was trying to impress, even in her own mind, that she had had this idea that like if she could write like a certain kind of like older male white writer like that this uh, she'd internalized like this is the best writing and that she was trying to write like that and pandering sort of in her terms to people that didn't weren't even really in existence for right like that Cormac McCarthy wasn't going to read her novel and be like you wrote a good western you know like it wasn't the sort of she picked the style in the world that she had bent herself toward in an attempt to do be correct or to be successful and in some of that essay her thinking about like what do I really want to write like what do I really want my style to be at? who am I really writing for and I think that's part of this too like we have this idea of like in, in fiction I'm sure in other fields of like what is good writing or what is successful writing or what is award-winning writing or whatever it is. And you can bend toward that in ways that, that warp you. Um, and it can be hard to, hard to catch. Um, and some of that is because per the perception of yourself is that the, the, uh, the rewards are there for people who write like this. And so you end up trying to, trying to pass as that kind of writer, even if you're not. 
Um, and it's, it's hard to do. It's hard to undo that, I think, and to really do what you want to do for yourself, um, especially when you're starting out. I would love to hear what um, both Matt and Ian have to say about the question, shouldn't an editor preserve the style of the writer? Yeah, I saw that. Um, uh, and, and an editor should, um, an editor's job is to, is to, to help, to make, to help make the work be what it is. Yeah. That's my answer. Uh, I, I don't think it's his original quote, but in, in Ben Dreyer's uh, book on style, he quotes another writer says, an editor should always preserve a writer's style if they have one, um, which feels like a nice sort of slight insult toward most writers. Um, <laughs> most of us aren't distinctive enough to save. Um, but I, yeah, I think I agree with Ian really exactly. I was a book editor for a long time too, and you're trying to make the thing be the greatest version of itself it could be. Um, and that, that did tend to mean suggesting lots of changes, but it wasn't about moving the writer away from what they were doing. It was trying to help them get there. Um, I feel that way when my books are being edited. Like I, they've all gone through really heavy editing processes um, and I'm happier with what comes out the other end than what I started with. I think that's ideal. Have you had someone edit you where it was the opposite though? Have you had gone through an editing process where you're like, oh no, like I'm, this is moving me away from my thing or, or I'm some, this is becoming something else and having to resist that I mean, um, or defend your style. Sometimes I've, sometimes I've felt that way during editorial and then we publish and I'm like, Oh yeah, I was totally wrong. Uh, usually when I do feel that way and it sticks, it's, it's small scale. It's like, no, I, I really was right to fight for that thing. We cut. I'm, it's, I can't believe we don't. We, 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 we left that out or, or sometimes you'll get feedback, you know, readers will, will say something and like, you know, I did kind of anticipate this. Um, mm -hmm. So, but those are just lessons for the, the next time. And, and, you know, being a, a writer who continuously writes is very different than, than being a writer who writes um, less frequently. And I think this is one of the things that's a real big difference between the experience of writing as a, as a scholar and that as a, a working writer and then whatever it is in between is you, you worry a little bit less about this. I mean, at, at novel scale, even, or at book scale, it's like, well, you know, it's a whole book. There's a lot in there. There's a lot going on. Um, and, but, and, 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 you know, like um, it's a trade-off too. Like you're paying a price to, to, to get a different benefit sometimes. I also think um, like the ideal editors I've had are people who like uh, love 90% of what I do and like the other 10% they're like, no, absolutely not. Like there's some 10% of like my style that my book editor is driven nuts by and fi you know fixes every time she sees it. And it's like, okay, good. Like push back on that thing and then makes the other part of it louder and better and more itself. Um, and that, that resistance is good too. I'd be suspicious of someone who took a novel of mine and was like, print it. Um, like that would not be the ideal process. I want that that sort of resistance um, in the way that that helps shape. I, yeah, I, I think yeah. that's the preference. But, and I think it's also important, you know, if we're talking about academics writing creative nonfiction or nonfiction, then we're talking about a very specific thing. And in, in my experience, one of the main jobs of the editor is to get rid of anything that even remotely smells of academic writing. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the, just to completely, and, and you don't even realize how much of that you've done <laughs> until someone goes through your stuff and is like, nope, nope, this, uh, no one talks this way. No, and I'm like, but I'm already a great writer. Look at my crazy good style. I'm already so good. And they're like, yeah, no, no one talks that way. No one wants to hear these phrases. I'll. When I have a minute to think, I'll tell you guys what those, I mean, we already know all these phrases, but I think they should be said again. Um, but yeah, things like, you know, when, when I say something like something that I think is really obvious, like environmental imagination. Right. Like, of course we all know what that is. Every single editor comes back and says, nope. Well, <laughs> um, yeah. 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 And I mean, I think this is related to, to Ron Broly, Brolio's question here about like this, this sort of, uh, uh, 10,000 word citadel that, that we, that we, we build when we, we write in a scholarly mode. So I, I think that that tendency 
that, that's just the editorial project. And it should be taking place on every kind of work, including scholarly work published in um, you know, uh, venues where only experts are, are meant to read them. You know, the, the, it's just that we've decided that when we speak to one another, we, we are okay with or even prefer doing so in a particular way. I'm not sure that I, and you know, I was trained in the same traditions as, as I, I, I modeled my writing after the same, um, I don't know that they were bad uh, 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 practices. It's just that they were very particular ones and idiosyncratic ones that, that, that everyone shouldn't have ever adopted. Um, and so that, that push to clarity or to, to, to specificity isn't to my mind, a, a compromise made, um, for the public. It's just that the, that the, the, someone who picks up a newspaper or, or a magazine or, or whatever, they're just busy and, and you have to respect their, their very different context. So we, 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 who are lucky enough to have scholarly careers are, are paid to do this work in a way. And so of course we have the time and the attention to devote to un unpacking a word that came up somewhere in the, in the, in the Q and A is it's that's a common example of, of, of something that we own. That's only, that's only us who use words like that. Right. It, it means something to us. It's a great word. It means something to us. Doesn't mean something to someone else. And so using it will introduce uh, uh, confusion. So I, I, I think there's a kind of dialectic at work in this kind of conversation in which it's not just about sort of taking ourselves and pushing um, out into the world, but also bringing those lessons from the world back in to the, the this is the so-called ivory tower and, and reforming and changing some of our uh, scholarly practices as well, as well. Yeah, I really l liked what you said, Ian, when you, uh, when you highlighted that that in that first thing where someone was talking about creativity, imagination, how it's an it's it's you know it's not just about policy, but it's also about values. I don't remember what it was, something like that, right? Um, and you said, what is the reader supposed to do with that, right? I mean, I think that if we were actually asking that question of ourselves in all our writing, right. well, it's very hard to do because I, I don't know the answer. <laughs> but I think if we were actually sort of posing that challenge to ourselves in all of our writing, things would seriously change if we did that in scholarly writing as well. What's the reader supposed to do with that? Mm -hmm. You know, I, uh, I feel like, you know, a lot of the people I know in my department here who are, are doing uh, what more purely academic work are do, trying to do the more popular facing or public facing work. And having worked with some of them, one of the things I found I kept suggesting over and over was like something that would be information in a in an essay could be made into like a scene. It really just show show don't tell kind of stuff, right? Like, and I would highlight it. Ron Burley was on the on the call, so he knows I've done this some of his, but just like highlight things and like make this a story, make this a scene, let us see that and feel that and then talk about it as opposed to just telling me about it. And that, that proportion changing where like the reader was allowed to sort of like see and imagine and, and participate as opposed to just being told for the, the duration thing really changed the, the way I, I interact with that kind of work. Um, and you, uh, Margaret was talking about argument and how that works, but like the proportion of argument going down a little bit and having a more participatory Part of that really changes the feel of a lot of that work. I think it'd be interesting to take uh, any scholarly piece of writing and look for where the scenes are in it and see what that like the possibilities of those are. It's just a practical way of looking for some of those moments that might have a different interaction with the audience. If our uh, viewers are interested in other uh, events in this series, we'll be holding an event on publishing with the university press, as well as an event on publishing journal articles. You can find details for those at ihr.asu.edu slash uh, events. ihr.asu.edu slash events. Um, so go check those out and we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Thanks all. Thanks everyone.